Well, good morning, everyone. Time to go ahead and get started with our services. Just want to welcome you here to the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we want to let you know you're an honored guest, and we welcome you to come back and join us at any opportunity that you have. This morning, we're gonna, our first song is going to be the number 694. If you're using the book, it'll be the number 694. If you want to go ahead and mark your scripture reading, that's going to come from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Just some general announcements before we get into those who are sick. Uh, if you have any updates for the bulletin, make sure you get that to us here at the office by Monday afternoon, and we'll make sure that we get that into next week's bulletin. If you will, this time, take an opportunity to go ahead and either silence or turn off your electronic devices so we don't disturb services. Um, visitation team number two. You'll be meeting this evening after services back in room number one. Uh, ladies, there's going to be a, another planning meeting. I guess this is going to be regards to the Ladies' Day. This will be this evening after services, and I was told it will take place up front here in the front of the auditorium. So make sure you stay around for that so you can help out. Uh, we have a congratulations in the congregation. Matthew and Chancey Woodside are grand grandparents. Uh, Brian and Justice, no Justice Knowles had a little baby boy. He was born on March 9th. His name is Lucian Knowles. So congratulations to that family. And I understand that mom and dad are still doing, are doing good, but probably still tired, still tired. Um, our gospel meeting is coming up here in just a few more weeks, so make sure you be grabbing some of those postcards that are out in the foyer and handing out to folks and inviting them to come to our gospel meeting. I've been announcing for the past few weeks this Amer Indian missions uh, work to get a new truck to the work down there. And the Bobby family here has sent a total of $10,000 over to help out with that. So thanks to everybody who helped out with that effort. Uh, there's two Ladies' Days coming up, both the Central Congregation here in town and East Main in Murfreesboro are having a Ladies' Day on Saturday, April 15th. So you got two options to choose from that day. There is uh, further information on the bulletin board regarding that. There's a gospel meeting that's beginning today and running through uh, Tuesday with Brother Chris Whitaker at the Arlington Congregation. So if you have an opportunity to go over there and support them, please do that. We've got a couple cards I was given. It says, thanks to all of you for your prayers, cards, calls after my, after my surgery. In Christian love, Martha Cathy. And the other one says, to my Christian family, there are no words to express how thankful I am for all your prayers, cards, calls, and your thoughtfulness. It is so wonderful to be in Christ's family. Jody Zuna. So I'll post these on the bulletin board. Anybody else wants to read those? Uh, upcoming youth activities. Um, their Bible Bowl season is over, but for all of those who participated in the Bible Bowl, including teachers and monitors that helped out at Bible Bowl, if you want to join us this evening after services, we're going to go to uh, Dairy Queen just to have a little celebration for this, this season that we had. Uh, spring Youth Retreat. There's still time to sign up for Spring Youth Retreat. Um, shirts have been ordered, but you can still sign up to attend that. And youth, there is a new class that's going to begin this morning. It's called Plugged In for Christ. It'll be upstairs in the youth room. And this is going to be for grades 5th through high school. So this is 5th through high school upstairs in the youth room. Now a few of those who are sick within our congregation... First song will be number 694, 694. To Canaan's land I'm born.
Please bow. Dear Lord, Father in heaven, we have thanks to be able to assemble here today free from persecution, to hear portions of your word, and we pray for the strength to apply it to our everyday lives, and we pray for forgiveness when we fall short. We pray for those that was mentioned here and those that among us that may be sick or injured, that your guidance be upon the caregivers of them, that they may make the best decisions so they can have the fastest recovery possible. And as always, dear Lord, we pray that our lives may be an example to others that would draw them near to your word. And we pray for forgiveness when we fall short. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be number 585. 585. <coughs> Soldiers of Christ, come. not blessed to live in a country where we can provide for ourselves, where we can do so without fear of any man. And God, through his providence, gives us the talents that we need to do those things that provide a living for us, but more importantly, that allow us to provide for the work of the church. And we're com commanded on each first day of the week to lay by and store as we have been profited. And I hope and trust this morning that you've examined yourself, that you've looked at your phys physical condition in life, and you have prepared to return to the Lord for the work in the treasury of the church. For your convenience, there are collection plates in the rear of the building if you did not see them when you came in this morning. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for the providence that you shower down upon each, us each day and through that, your love. 
for your support that gives us the mental and physical capacity to go about the activities of life and perform the duties that you have given to us so that we might use those talents that we have. Father, we're thankful that you bless us such. We pray this day that we can return to you a small portion of that that you have given to us. And Father, we pray that our elders will look at that donation. They will use it to spread your word, to do benevolent work, and to take care of those of this community who need our care and our love. Father, forgive us of our sins as we return so that this offering would be acceptable in thy sight. In this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name, and amen. If you're using the songbook and would like to mark the invitation song, we'll use number 701. We'll sing that following the lesson. And now as we prepare our minds to protect the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 511. 511. <clears throat> oh, we come together. Is there anyone who did not receive a communion cup? If there is, please just raise your hand and our ushers will bring you one. As Christians, we know that in the Gospels, Christ established the memorial that we celebrate this day and every Sunday. As he set aside the opportunity for us to remember the great sacrifice that he would make, that we would be reminded of the plan of salvation that God and he established from the beginning of time. And then in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <coughs> beginning at verse 23, Paul reminded the Corinthians of why we do what we do, and he repeated and established the plan by which we celebrate the memorial that we celebrate this day. And we do so by beginning to remember Christ's body that hung upon the cross. This time, may we offer thanks for the bread. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the plan of salvation 
that allows us as Christians to have the promise and the hope of eternal life so that we can live and serve with you through eternity. And we know, Father, that that plan was established and that Christ set it upon uh, each of us the requirement and the opportunity to celebrate and commemorate his death, his burial, and his resurrection each and every first day of the week. We thank you for this bread which symbolizes his body and the great persecution and the suffering under, un, under which he went. Father, as we're commanded to examine ourselves, may we make sure that our life is acceptable in your sight so that as we take of this bread this day, that we would be pleasing unto you and have fulfilled that commandment that you established. This prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. And amen. Likewise, Father, we are thankful for this fruit of the vine that is emblematic of the blood that Christ shed. We realize that that blood allows us to be washed continually from our sins. And once again, we are thankful that he chose to allow himself to come to earth to be that sacrifice that we could not make ourselves. Be with us as we take of this, uh, this fruit of the vine that represents that blood. May we, re we reflect on the great blessings that are offered to us, and the great sacrifice that he made. And in Christ's name, amen. As announced, our reading will be coming from the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's a privilege and a delight to look out and see each of you this morning for our wonderful opportunity to be able to worship God together and to be able to look at the letters that John wrote. The beloved Apostle John wrote an account of the gospel of the life of Christ. He wrote three letters and he wrote the book of Revelation. And in those books, John explains to us so much that we need to know in this life. He told us who Jesus was and how Jesus lived. He told us about Jesus coming again in the book of Revelation. And when we read his letters, there ought to be a sense of interest, a sense of inquiry that we want to know what it is that God wants us to be and what it is that God wants us to know. If you reflect on what John just wrote in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, and he said, if you know God, you know love. And there's an oft-repeated phrase sometimes that's usually used with the word peace, but if you know God, you really know what love is because you see it in him. 
If you have no love, that is the two-letter word N-O, then you have no God at all. Because if there's not a God, there's no real love in this world. You see, what John was trying to do was to get his readers to appreciate and know the very nature of God. Who is God and how does he work in this world? Well, John said, in him is light and in him is no darkness at all. And John tells us that he is truth and in him is no lie at all. And John is talking about Jesus and the Father having love. And if you and I are going to be what God wants us to be, we're going to have to understand that because we will reflect what we learn from God. Perhaps the best way I can think of to illustrate it is like a little child. You know, Brian and Justice now have a little boy in this, brought in this world. And, you know, you think about what all he's going to learn, what all he's going to do. But he's going to learn how to talk from his mom and dad. He's going to learn matters of right and wrong from them, just like each of us did. And when you think about our spiritual lives, you and I learn from God what love is and how to practice that love. The Apostle John teaches us about real, genuine, sacrificial love. Because when we use the word love today in our society, there's so many people who have a misconception about it. They think of love as being something that's just sort of a feeling some sort of thing that you can fall in of and fall out of, but real, genuine, the kind of love that God had for us and that we are to have for one another is a mature love. Now, when I study 1 John, there are three things that I see in this chapter and in these letters. The first is a perfected love. And John's going to talk about that in chapter 4 as well as he did in chapter 2. We're going to have to understand what a perfected love is because that's what we're trying to accomplish. Then he's going to talk about a perverted love. One that loves something that shouldn't be loved. And then finally, a practice love. One that puts into practice loving other people the way we ought to. Let's begin first of all. And John is often called the Apostle of Love because he writes about it perhaps more than any other. I've already been working on my sermon outline. In fact, it's already completed for two weeks from tonight. So you already know that it's, it's on my mind. I'm going to be preaching about James and John. And I'll go ahead and tell you that James and John didn't always exhibit in their lives love for other people. In fact, there were times when they wanted to call down fire out of heaven and just burn people up. But John learned the idea of love. In fact, in the gospel account, 57 times he uses the word love. That ought to make us think, step back and think, well, that was something important to John. He learned a little bit more about it. In John 13, 34, and 35, that night in which the Lord established the Lord's Supper, celebrating the Passover, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. People would be able to look at Christians and say, they're different. They treat people differently. They act differently because their love is is like the love of Christ. In chapter 17, in verse 23, when he prayed his prayer, he said, I and them and you and me, that they may be one, perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. Jesus is saying in his prayer, Father, you have loved my apostles. You have loved my disciples the same way that you have loved me. And then John speaks about this perfected love. Let me take you to a couple passages here. Go to chapter 2 in verse 5, and John writes, 
But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. The man who keeps God's word, God's love has been, let's look at that word, perfected in him. Well, let me carry a little bit further. Let's go to this chapter we're studying about this morning. Chapter 4. Let's look at verse 12 and then verses 17 and 18. Because John will write, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Now, you drop down to verse 17. Love has been perfected in us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, pause with me. You know, when you're reading through this, sometimes it's easy to just skip over some of the, the details of it. But he says here, love has been perfected in us in this, that when the day of judgment comes, we're, we can be bold. We can be confident and well, how can we do that? Because as he is, as God is, so are we in this world. That's the way we live. We live like he did. Verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. When you think about illustrating something like that, here's, here's the best way I can think of. Maybe you're a toddler, and you've done wrong. Your mom and your dad come to you, and they say, you're going to have to be punished. And they look at you, and they say, this hurts us more than it hurts you. And you're thinking, right. It really hurts. If they loved me, they wouldn't do this to me. You get a little bit older, and then you're a teenager. And then as a teenager, you... Do not do what your parents tell you to do. And they tell you, we're doing this because we love you. And you think, right. They don't love me. They're trying to restrict me. But then you become an adult and you have a child of your own. And you look at that child and you have great love, great devotion to that child. And you do what's in their best interest. And then you look at your mom and dad and now you realize... All along, they were telling me the right thing because they really love me and they care for me. And then you get to be an older person and your mom and your dad are now at the sunset years of their life. And they may be old and they may be feeble. And they tell you what's important to them. And now you love them because you know they loved you. And you're not fearful anymore because the fear's not there. They're, they're, they're old and they're weak and they're struggling. Now it's a matter of love and respect. The more we are perfected in love is the fact that we get to the point in life where we serve God not out of fear of God somehow punishing us, now we serve God because we truly love him and we want to serve him. What does that really mean? How do we really apply that? Well, to be perfected means to be complete, to be mature. It means to be fully developed. It means to reach a goal. And God has shown us perfect love and expects us to have that same kind of love in ourselves. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 5. What a wonderful passage where the Lord spoke about, you've heard it said to love your neighbor but hate your enemy. And he says, I want you to look and see what God has done. He makes the sun and the rain come on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. You see, God treats people well regardless of who they are and how they live. That weren't true, God would not be so gracious to all of us who dwell on this world of his. But then he comes to the point, and he puts it like this in chapter 5 and verse 48. Therefore you shall be perfect, 
just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What's he talking about? He's talking about love. A perfect love that treats people better than they deserve. Who treats people right and good. I could compare this to several other things in Scripture. For instance, what does it mean to be perfect in faith? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the fullness, or the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Someone says, I can't be perfect in faith. No, you can't. But you can be mature in your faith. James would put it like this in James 2, verse 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? The context of that is Abraham believing God. God told Abraham to leave his family and to leave his country to go to a place that he didn't even know where it was, and he went out not knowing where he was going. He told him to offer his son Isaac as an offering. And he was willing to do so because his maturity was he believed God. He trusted God. That's what ends involved. You see, a perfect love is completely obedient. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's not tough to do that. You have to constantly evaluate your own life and say, am I maturing? Am I growing in my love for one another? Hopefully we are. Hopefully we're not allowing ourselves to be led by the world to hate God and to hate his people, to hate other people. Many of us love ourselves too much to sacrifice, to forgive and show compassion to other people. And what we ought to be doing is learning to love God more, learning to love our fellow man more, and that's where love is perfected. Now, the second part, perverted love. Now, John, in this letter, has described people who have love, but it's focused in the wrong direction. If you go back to chapter 2 in verse 15, he says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's some people whose desire is to have what the world offers and they love worldly things in contrast to the spiritual things. You know, Paul says about Demas, he's loved me or forsaken me having loved this present world, the book of Colossians. Here's a man who was attracted and drawn away and his love was perverted in 1 John chapter 3, verse 19, And this is condemnation that light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They love darkness because they do the bad things. You know, I was, I'm sometimes amazed at this world and what the world wants and how perverted it has become. But it's because the world is wanting to do what it wants to do, not what God says. We're seeing a real conflict in our culture today between those who love God and those who don't love him. But even among religious people, even among people who claim to love God, John would write in John 12, verses 42 and 43, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They love what men think. They care what men think. 
And it's easy for us to get into this situation. Who am I going to serve? What God wants me to do or what the world is asking me to do? And we somehow just allowed our love to be motivated by that. We'll be studying the third letter of John in a few weeks. And in 3 John verse 9, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, does not receive us. Here's a man who loves being first. We put he loves being top dog. He loves being the ones in charge and deciding who comes and who goes and who doesn't. There's some people who are so selfish. For them, it is all about how does this affect me? That's a perverted love. That's not the kind of love that God wants us to have. In Luke 6 and verse 32, Jesus said, But if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. Folks, it's hard sometimes to love folks who are mean and hateful and hurtful. But if we're going to have a love that is correct, not as one that is perverted, we're going to have to love everyone. That leads me to the third part of our lesson where we get to the idea of practiced love. And can you claim something if you do not practice it? For instance, someone says, are you a preacher? Well, yes, I'm a preacher. Where do you preach? I don't preach anywhere. Well, are you a preacher? When do you preach? Well, I haven't preached anywhere. Well, how can you be a preacher if you don't do it? How can you be a plumber if you don't practice your plumbing? How can you be anything if you don't actually do it? Well, let's again compare that to faith. If you will, let's go to James chapter 2 and let's look at what James says here in verses 14 through 18. It's a real interesting way that James presents this. He begins by asking a question. What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And then he asks, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. I think everybody understands that. Everybody can, can grasp the idea of someone coming to us and say, you know, I believe in God. I love my fellow man. And someone comes up and says, I'm hungry. I don't have anything to eat, and I'm cold. I don't have any place to stay, and I don't even clothes. I need, I need a jacket. And you look at it and say, well, I sure hope you find something to eat today. I hope you, somewhere along your way, you find you a good coat to wear. Be warmed and filled. He said, if you don't give them what's needful for the body, what does it profit them? What does it benefit them? Well, I can tell you, if you're on the receiving end of that, it doesn't benefit you at all. And if a person says they believe God and they don't do anything, he says, that's a dead faith. And a dead faith won't save anybody. You see, love has to be practiced just like faith. Well, now let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Let's look at verses 16 through 18 because John is also going to address the same thing with love as James addressed it with faith. Here's the way he would put it. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But it, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need 
and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Well, that sounds just exactly what James said with regards to faith. Here's a man who has this world's goods. It's not the fact that he doesn't have the money, the resources to be able to share. But he looks at him and the Bible says he shuts up the heart of compassion, literally the bowels of compassion. You know, that part of man which you feel with, he doesn't have any concern for him at all. And he does not give him anything John asked the question, how does the love of God abide in him? You know, how's it there? Well, obviously it's not. And so he finishes by saying, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's so easy to talk about it. It's not so easy always to do it. Because the real love that John is describing here this practice kind of love actually does something for somebody. Now, you can easily see how God did this for us. If we start talking about God's love for us, John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or as John would put it in 1 John 4 verse 10, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's not like I somehow became this great person. No, God loved us. And Paul would put in Romans 5, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the way God loves That's the way he practices it. In in John's gospel, chapter 13, verse 1, he would write, Now the feast of the Passover, which Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Even while they were abandoning him right and left, being scattered all about, Even his closest friends like Peter denying him three times, the Lord never failed to love all of them to the end. It's tough to love people when they abandon you, when they betray you. But Jesus loved people to the end because that's the kind of love that he practiced. Now, our love can be seen in what we do, how we act. Let me take you through a few passages which I think are helpful, and then we're going to bring the lesson to a close. In 1 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 4, or verse, yeah, verse 4, and we're going to read through the first part of verse 8, Paul will describe what love actually does. He said, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. When Paul writes that, I I go back and you could just parse each one of those words and, and see what it really means in its depth. But basically, it's not selfish. It's serving. It's helping. It's enriching. Or you can go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, where Peter would write and tell us, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, 
In the sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Fervently with a pure heart. He goes on to say in chapter 3, Finally, all of you be of like mind or one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but contrary blessing, knowing that you were called for this, that you may inherit a blessing. The context of 1 Peter is saints that are being attacked for their faith. And when we are attacked for our faith, we often want to look out and say, I'm just going to take care of myself. And he says, no, that's not the way it is. You've got to love your brethren fervently. And he goes on to say that when you start looking at people attack you, you return a blessing. That's hard to do. In Galatians 5 verse 13, Paul said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. How do you look at the church? And when I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about the people, the congregation. Do you look at the church as something that is to be serving me? Taking care of my needs? Or do you look at the church as those that you are to serve? That you are to help? So go to Romans 12, verse 10. He says, be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Are we putting the needs of the congregation above our own? That's what real love does now. Or Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. I love studying the book of Colossians because it tells us, just like the book of Ephesians does, what it really means to look like a Christian. He says, therefore, as the elect of God put on holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against any or against another, Even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called to be holy, or in one body, and be thankful. The bond of perfection, pursuing this. Now, God is our best example of what love should look like. Because God always does what is in our best interest. And sometimes that may not look like love to us. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer there is trying to get us to understand what it means to go through a life that has difficulties and trials in it. And sometimes when our parents allow us to go through difficulties, we're wondering, why don't they love me? Why don't they remove this burden from me? Well, they really are loving us because they're trying to train us. They really are loving us because they're trying to show us a better way. And God expects us to do the same for others. Sometimes genuine love has to tell somebody there's some changes that need to be made. From where I stand, On this side, when I preach God's word and I'm trying to say, folks, we need to be doing better sometimes. We need to do a better job of showing our love. It's not because I thought, ah, ha, ha, look what I get to tell them. It's like Paul said in Galatians 4 verse 16, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. If someone exposes our weaknesses and they're doing it because they want to make us better because they want us to go to heaven they're really our friend in Proverbs 3 verse 12 for whom the Lord love he corrects just as a father the son in whom he delights or Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 as many as I love I rebuke and chasten 
Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I'd suggest to you that all of us have some way to go to have a perfected love. To get to the point where we love like the Lord loved us. Till we get to the point where we understand that the first and great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we appreciate the second commandment, that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. There's sometimes that we need to be urged and encouraged to do a better job, and I think we do. We've got to avoid being having a perverted love that loves the wrong things and then to practice it in our life. We're going to sing the song, Tomorrow May Be Too Late. There's a powerful message in that song. Tomorrow may be too late. Because many people who have planned, I'm going to take care of my salvation. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to do that when it's a lot easier to do it. There will be no better time than right now. You may not want to do it tomorrow. You may not have a tomorrow to do it in. God does not guarantee us that there will be a tomorrow here on this earth. If you're not a Christian, why not believe in Jesus Christ? Repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized this morning. If you're a Christian, and you look at your life and you say, I know I'm not right. I've got some things I need to change. We studied about Simon last week, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. He was told to repent and to pray. After he was told what could come upon him, he asked Peter, he says, pray for me. And that's what we'll do. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, would you come as we stand and sing? Today is the day of salvation. number 682.
You know, the weather condition day is like it's been every Sunday I've been up here. It's wet and cool or cold. But aren't we thankful that we have a good facility that we can worship the Lord in that's dry and warm and the comfort of these seats? We give God the glory and the praise for all things. And we want to thank each of you for being here this morning. For those of you who are visiting with us, we welcome you and we invite you to come and worship with us at every opportunity that you may have. I want to thank those who have joined us this morning on YouTube or Facebook or Ben Lowen TV. We appreciate your love for the Word of God, and we hope that the, your situation will change in the, in the near future, that you'll be able to come and join us in person for our worship service. I want to thank all the men who have led us in our worship service, and thank you, Tony, for that good lesson on love. Very, very good lesson. Our Bible classes begin at 10.15 and last until 11 o'clock. We hope that you'll stay for our Bible classes and then be back this evening at 6 p.m. for our evening worship service. In visitation group two, remember you're meeting tonight after our 6 p.m service and also to add what Jason said don't forget our gospel meeting in the foyer on the tables there are cards postcards that you can mail if you have friends mail to your friends your family that love you you can mail them some but whatever you do take them and let's use them and give them to people and invite people to come to our gospel meeting. Brother B.J. Clark will be doing the speaking. We want to remember those who are sick in our daily prayers, to send them cards, call them on the phone, to visit them as we have the opportunity to do so, and let's help brighten their day. It's surprising what a call or a card will do for a person when they're ill. It just makes them feel a whole lot better, and I know that we'll all want to do that. We'll sing this song, Be Let, in our dismissal prayer. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee again for another opportunity to come in Thy church and worship Thee in spirit and truth, sing these songs of praise to Thy high and glory name. We thank Thee, Lord, for the good lesson that Brother Tony has given us about love, that we may show love and respect for our fellow man, our, our fellow Christians, Lord, that we may show a light unto them that You gave Your only begotten Son for us, that he loved us as well. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless those that are mentioned here that are sick, sick of our congregation, our community, friends, family, and loved ones. We pray that you will bless them, be thy will, restore them back to their normal places in life. 
Lord, we pray for our military that has helped protect him, our country and other countries, Lord. We pray that you would bless them, keep them out of harm's way. Be with them, Lord, as well. Continue to bless us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Watch over us, Lord. And when we are weak, we pray for strength and guidance in thy word. In Jesus Christ's most holy name, amen. Amen.